this is a, a quick video, or won't be that quick, because I'm about to read the only uh, philosophy paper that's been submitted in blank verse by a philosopher called Charles Pidgeon, who is a professor of uh, philosophy in Otago in um, New Zealand. And uh, I mean, I came across it because I was reading about Coriolanus earlier, looking at um, some stuff about agrarian land reform in the uh, Roman Republic. Um, and uh, Coriolanus is one of my favourite Shakespeare plays. And the, um, the film, which uh, has Ralph Fiennes in it, is a really good film. It's really worth watching. Um, so, anyway, Charles Pigeon wrote a paper which is on the screen here, Conspiracy Theories and the Conventional Wisdom by Charles Pidgeon. Um, the abstract is, uh, Conspiracy Theories should be neither believed nor investigated. That is the conventional wisdom. I argue that it is sometimes permissible both to investigate and to believe. Hence this is a dispute in the ethics of belief. I defend epistemic orts, which apply in the first instance to belief-forming strategies, which are partly under our control. But the belief forming strategy of not believing conspiracy theories would be a political disaster and the epistemic equivalent of self mutilation. I discuss several variations of this strategy interpreting conspiracy theory in different ways, but I conclude that in all these readings the conventional wisdom is deeply unwise. Now, there's another, um, there's a historian, sociologist um, called. Uh, uh, Lance de Haven and Lance de Haven has advanced a theory uh, of SCADs, which is uh, state conspiracies against democracy, uh, in which um, it's a similar kind of thing for uh, taking the intellectual snobbery or uh, whatever out of conspiracy theories. Now. This paper is well worth reading. I will put a link in the uh, description. Um, just a bit more about the author. Here he is here, Charles Pidgeon. And um, there's a description here of, of, of his interests. Um, It says, uh, Charles dabbles his fingers in many philosophical pies. His chief interest is in meta-ethics. He is a defender of the error theory with special interests in Moore, Hume, and the is-ought question. He is the only philosopher of his acquaintance to have published a philosophical dialogue in blank verse, uh, which is called Complots of Mischief, which I'm going to read uh, just in a second. Um, so... I'm not going to read the uh, prose commentary in between the uh, between the actual blank verse, uh, and so um, this is Complots of Mischief by Charles Pidgeon. Uh, the abstract in part one: I contend, using Coriolanus as my mouthpiece, that Keeley and Clark have failed to show that there is anything intellectually suspect about conspiracy theories per se. In part two, I argue in propria persona that the idea that there is something suspect about conspiracy theories is one of the most dangerous and idiotic superstitions to disgrace our political culture. So, uh, let's read the, uh, the blank verse poem. 1. Coriolanus Philosopher It is a pur purpose thing and grows by plot to curb the will of the nobility. Brutus Get you hence instantly and tell those friends they've chose a council that will from them take their liberties, make them of no more voice than dogs that are as often beat for barking as therefore kept to do so. Sicinius, let them assemble and on a safer judgment all revoke your ignorant election. Sicinius. To the capital come, we will there before the stream o' the people, and this shall seem as partly tis their own, which we have goaded onward. At some time, when his soaring insolence shall touch the people, 
which time shall not want, if he be put upon, and that's as easy as to set dogs on sheep, will be his fire to kindle their dry stubble and their blaze, shall darken him for ever. Keely, my lord, although there be such a plot, tis folly to believe it. Why, how's that? Keely, my noble lord, there are indeed some things which, though they may be true, it is not meet for wise men to believe. Though there may be complots of mischief and conspiracies, the dark designs of devious wicked men, yet to believe it shows a grievous a fault. What we believe we mostly take on trust, and if we cannot trust we know nothing know. To think that we are mostly sore deceived is to commit self-slaughter of the mind, to smother in a mist of ignorance. Why, if we cannot trust, we cannot tell what is from what is not. Our very names we only know from what our dams do say. It is Volumia's word that makes you think that you are Caius Marcius. Coriolanus. By the gods, I've never heard such skimble scamble stuff, because I think these shallow chattering curs, these tritons of the minnows, these vile tribunes, for I do think that is the worse of words, conspire and plot to cause my overthrow. Must I believe my mother is a liar? That men do lie, I have good cause to know, as all men know that sometimes walk abroad, outside the cloistered den of learned fools. But though some men do lie, and some do cloak their dark designs in servile secrecy, it does not follow, nay, it is not so, that all men lie, and no man tells the truth. If the everlasting gods have fixed their canon against self-slaughter of the intellect, I sin not when I do suspect such men, base Brutus and the sly Sicinius of crooked low and vile conspiracy. To trust them not is not to give up trust in testimony's witness, nor to doubt all that I know that's known upon report. Keely, but noble Coriolanus, nonetheless, you may commit another kind of fault by rashly positing conspiracy. You make the world more rational than it is. Attribute purpose to the purposelessness. Read reason into what is reasonless. reasonless. Because you cannot tolerate the thought that change and not design doth rule the world. You do prefer the plots of evil men to worlds where none can ever lose the plot. Since there's no plot to lose, where's there's no plan but time and chance and witless randomness, you cannot bear the thought, and thus for you evil is better than absurdity, a plot to happenstance. Coriolanus. Why, that's enough. The mutable, rank-scented moiety may change their minds, but not as quick as that. Not all at once, not without prompting, no, they were persuaded to it, I am sure. And if they were, who did it but that pair of slinky, sly and cankered politicians and these base acolytes? They have conspired to bring me down and rob me of my fame. Though chance may rule the world, what chance is there that the base multitude, all at one breath, should on a sudden all take back their breaths that I did beg for in the marketplace? But if you think that I take comfort from it, that I believe what I would fain be true, then sure you are mistaken. I do know that some men plan, for I know I do plan, that some men plan in secret, for I know that I from time to time have secret plans, however so brave a warrior may be. He bootless fights who fights without a plan, or shows his enemies his true intent. I do not lie, not even to my foes, but I have spider foes who lie to me endeavouring to entrap me in their webs. Perhaps the world at large is purposeless, but men have purposes, both good and bad. All that's required for base conspiracy is secret plans pursued by secret means, and sometimes lightly sourced with hateful lies. That's all. So when I say that some men do conspire, I read no reason into this, our world, than that we know exists no purposes, but those of men we know have purposes. As for observity, why, this I say, it's a mad world indeed where such as they, 
Brutus, that is, and damned Sicinius. Such things, such vile and petty, stinking things, can have the power, the power to do me wrong, to rob me of everything I once held dear, my consulship, my hearth, my home, my bed, my wife, my son, indeed my very Rome, to rob me worse of all, of wealth no more. The gods care not they have no purposes, unless their purpose is to see the play, to laugh as we do laugh when players speak, to sigh as we do sigh when players die, taking our pleasure in the player's woe. No, learned sir, I say conspiracy, consistence is with grim absurdity. Clark, my lord, you're right, but yet I think you're wrong. Reasons there are, though Keeley knows them not, why thinking men should doubt conspiracy. Theories that posit plots do mostly form the cause and central claims of research programmes that Lakatos would call degenerate. Coriolanus, degenerate? How am I degenerate? Clark, peace, peace, my lord, I meant not to offend. For me, degenerate is a term of art, which I apply to theories, not to men. Coriolanus, so tis my thoughts you call degenerate. That's better, but not much. Why do you say it is degenerate if I believe that Brutus and Sicinius have conspired to spoil me of the consulate? Clark. Why this? A programme's good and ought to be believed, if it's progressive. But the which I mean, that what it prophesies doth come to pass, that is, when what it prophesies is new, and what it doth forbid, that happens not. A programme's bad, degenerate as we say, if what it prophesies that happens not, and what it doth forbid, why that takes place. The theory's good if the new facts fit in, bad if it must be bent to fit the facts. Coriolanus, if I suspect those politicians vile conspired to bring me down, then my belief concerns not what will be but what has been. I prophesy nothing when I do assert the people were misled by demagogues. Clark, forgive me, noble lord, if I misspoke. The prophecies need not concern the future. They are sometimes conditional in form, as if we would do this, we would see that. Thus, if we did interrogate the men who passed betwixt the tribunes and the plebs, they would admit that they had been set on to sway the populace to change their minds. Coriolanus, when then is my belief degenerate? Have the supposed conditions proven false? I do not know the slimy go-between. I do not say the middle men, because extremes and middle are much less than men, that link the loathsome tribunes and the mob, yet that there are such men I have no doubt. So many minds cannot have changed at once, all unpersuaded, and the base-born pair did not have time to do it on their own. Thus, if we found the go-betweens, why then, we have good cause to think they would confess, if I applied persuasion on my part, but e'en if I am wrong, it has not yet been tested. From the which I do conclude, my program is not yet degenerate. To be degenerate is to fail a test, and since it is a test I have not taken, ergo it is a test I have not failed. Clark, perhaps, my lord, you are in this correct. Not every fancied plot, maybe not most, doth constitute the centre and the core of some degenerating research programme, nonetheless. Coriolanus, how, nonetheless? Clark, I do believe it is a fault, an intellectual sin, to rashly postulate conspiracy. To do so indicates that you commit the fundamental attribution error. Coriolanus, why, sir, you've said a mouthful. What is that? If that your sense doth match your thunderous sound, it cannot choose but be a grievous fault. Clark, a common crime perhaps forgivable, an error to the which we are all prone. Briefly, it's this. We tend to give to men a greater share of casual influence than they should rightly have. We do suppose that we are not the slaves of circumstance, 
and that our actions do originate in our wills and our own characters, whereas research has shown it is not so. If men seem pious, why, this is because their circumstance makes for piety. If they seem villains, this then is the cause. Their circumstance make for villainy. And if courageous, then the reason is, their circumstances make for bravery. Coriolanus, this cannot be. Clark, but sir, it truly is, as learned men have proved by many trials. What trials? Why trials such as this? A set of young divines were set to preach, uplifting sermons on true charity. How we should help the stranger in our midst, how hospitality doth please the gods, how no man is an island, and how each should help the other, though he knows him not. What twaddling stuff is this? Sir, never mind. The point is that these priestlings did believe, and were about to preach what they believed, but yet they were informed of one thing more. They all were told they were already late to preach their sermons on true charity, and in their haste they none of them displayed the virtue they were all prepared to preach. A player was engaged to take the part of a sick man in need of urgent help, who moaned and groaned beside the priestling's path. Most ignored him, some indeed, or leapt, his suffering body slumped upon their road. Coriolanus, what would you prove by this improving tale? Clark, it is not character, nor yet belief, that makes men thus and so, but circumstance. The priestlings were in haste, that was enough, to make them disregard the principles they were about to teach, but which we see the fault, dear Marcius, lies not in ourselves, nor in the stars, but in the circumstance that we are underlings or overlords, for we do act as all or most would act, were they in the same circumstance as we. Carolanus, dear Marcius, am I not to such as you? But let that rest, for I would like to know what all this has to do with that wild plot by which the tribunes drove me forth from Rome. Clark, my lord, in postulating such a plot, you magnify the men you would despise. If Brutus and Sicinius did the deed, then they transcended circumstance and were the men whose mighty wills did move the state. It was their purposes that pushed you out, and their desires that sent you on your way. Most men are mostly slaves to circumstance. If, But if you're right, it seems this petty pair... These tritons of the minnows, as you say, are less the slaves of circumstance than most, making them mightier than they seem to be. In general, when we postulate a plot, we make too much of men and not enough of circumstance, which, as the learned think, is the great mover of the deeds of men. I do not say that men do never plot, or that men plotting never do succeed, but I do say we are too prone to think that what is seldom so is often so because we think that men, the masters are, of social circumstance and not its slave. That is the fault, the intellectual sin, the fundamental attribution error, of which perhaps too pompously I spoke. Coriolanus, I will not recapitulate my case for thinking that those swine have done me wrong. Let me just say it seems a miracle that all the plebs at once should change their minds. If they were not persuaded, let me ask, if you told rabbits that they were up to, to preach a simple sermon on sweet charity, but that they were all late, what would they do? Rabbits, my noble lord, that's what I said. If you put rabbits in the priestling's place, what would they do? Why, nothing, noble lord, except eat grass, and maybe lollipop. What about a brick? A brick, my lord? Why, yes, a brick. If it were told to preach, what would it do? Clark, why, nothing much. Rabbits at least can lollop, but a brick, being inanimate, is not inclined to any course of action. Coriolanus, so I thought. But if you are correct, it seems to me, the learned men you speak of must be wrong, for they do think our acts originate in social circumstance, not human wills. Yet, if we put a rabbit in the place of the delinquent priestlings, it appears the rabbit would not act as they did act. Whence I conclude that social circumstance is less omnipotent than, you, than they suppose, since human dispositions are required for human action to eventuate. The casual powers, so it seems to me, are evenly divided, since we need not only social circumstances, but the casual qualities of humankind, 
for priestlings not to practice what they preach. Clark, the point is not that social circumstance produces its effects without the aid of human dispositions, not at all. The point is rather that the differences between the acts of one man and the next are not to be explained by character, or what they want, or what they do believe, but by the circumstances that they face. And since the social circumstances make the difference between that man and this, not human nature, which remains the same, when human action is to be explained, tis circumstance should take the centre stage. The fundamental attribution error makes far too much of individual men. Their tastes, beliefs, desires and characters are not enough of social circumstance, which, with human nature, rules the roost. Coriolanus. If that's the point, how then? How am I at fault in postulating base conspiracy? My lord, the plot in which you do believe depends on characters that you think base, peculiar to the two conspirators. If action does not flow from character, but circumstance and human nature both, plots that depend on special characters are like not to be true. If circumstance makes all the difference twixt man and man, then theories that say otherwise are false, such as the theory that you do propose. If plots derive from special characters, and special characters do not exist, then nothing comes from that which nothing is, and your conspiracy melts into air. Coriolanus, if you were right, as sure I think you're wrong, and character played no part in our fate, it would not follow that conspiracies were brain-sick fancies based upon a myth. If I were, as I thanks to God I am not, and as I think I truly cannot be, the base-born champion of the stinking plebs, a thought almost too foul to contemplate, my social situation would be this. I would perceive the man that I did hate, Marcius, that bloody mass of monstrous pride, would fain destroy my power if he became Rome's council. I would know the common folk had all unwisely given him the power to disempower the tribunes and the plebs. I would perceive that I might have the chance to make them take back that too mighty gift that he had just been granted. Knowing this, what would I do? If I, like many men, I don't say all, desired security and the continuance of present power, why, then I would command my go-betweens to go rouse up the people to take back the gift of voices fondly thrown away upon a proud and stiff-necked enemy. This would I do because of circumstance, the circumstance that is that I perceive, and dispositions base that I would share with many other men, from which we see that when we postulate conspiracy, we need not think that special characters that differ between one man and the next push on the plotters to concoct their plot. I can conceive that sovereign circumstance makes all the difference twixt man and man, but still believe that some men sometimes plot because the circumstances that they face differ from those of non-conspirators. Not many men are tribunes of the plebs that have their voices yielded up to me, hence few have done what that base pair have done. But many men would act as they did act if they were placed as that vile pair were placed. Thus, if we are the slaves of circumstance, since circumstance makes all the difference between the different acts of different men, it does not follow that men do not plot. Hence, I commit no intellectual crime when I suspect a vile conspiracy. But there is more. Clark, what more, my lord? Coriolanus, why this? You, your learned men, I say, are learned fools if they do not think that social circumstance, even the circumstances that they perceive, makes all the difference twixt man and man. It is not true that men are all alike. Men differ much in what they do desire, in what they like and what they do dislike, in what they do admire and what despise. Some men there are love not a gaping pig, some that are mad if they behold a cat, and others, when the bagpipe sings in the nose, cannot contain their urine for affection. Mistress of passion sways it to the mood of what it likes or loathes. When circumstance is much the same for one man and the next, it is affection makes the difference, since we are not affected all alike. In battle some men fight and some men flee, since some men think brave death outweighs bad life, while some think that life outweighs harsh death. 
however grave or honourable some men do think it were an easy leap to pluck bright honour from the pale-faced moon, whilst those that think that honour is but air, such souls of geese that bear and the shapes of men. In consul, some are silent, some speak up, some men prefer to follow, some to lead, and when the king's a child and the next heir is regent and protector of the state, some men would kill their kin to gain a crown and buy a kingdom with a nephew's blood, whilst other uncles, other kin of kings, although they face the selfsame circumstance, prefer their kin to kingship and disdain to cut a kingly throat to gain a throne. Whence it appears that social circumstance is not always what makes the difference between the acts of one man and the next. Now hear this. My ears are open, good, my lord. Carolez, that's very fine, since I have heard you not out. Though you did say my theory formed the core of a degenerating research programme, though you did make my bravery a thing solely of circumstance, and did suggest that the base plot by which I was overthrown was nothing but a figment of my fancy, that to believe it was a kind of crime, the fundamental attribution error. Well, we now have seen the errors are all yours, that my belief the tribunes did conspire was nothing in the least degenerate, that courage, whether mine or any man's, is never solely due to circumstance, that even if it were, and circumstance made all the difference twixt man and man, it would not follow that men never plot, or that the tribune's base did not conspire in thinking that they did, I did not make the fundamental attribution error. For it appears that actions often flow from our desires, dislikes and dispositions in which we differ one man from the next. Thus, if I make the tribune's appetites, desires they do share with better men, the cause and origin of their vile plot, this is no sin, no intellectual crime, since men are often moved by appetites which go unshared by others. Thus it seems there's nothing fond or foolish, nothing wrong in postulating, base conspiracy. But now, good sirs, good day, I've had enough. I have not time to listen to such stuff. I have revenge to plot. I would strike home against those base slaves that drove me forth from Rome. Yeah, it then goes on with this very amusing um, extract or analysis of uh, David Hume's uh, collected works and correspondence. Um, Hume wrote a history of England, which I've been dipping into the last uh, week or so. Um, anyway, uh, this this is really quite funny. Um, let us start with history. In the electronic edition of the collected works and correspondence of David Hume, the word conspiracy occurs 191 times. The word conspiracy is 45 times. The word conspirator 70 times. Conspirator 12 times. Conspired twice. Conspire 11 times. Conspired 23 times. Conspired a misspelling of conspired twice. Conspiring 8 times. Plot 94 times. Plots 9 times. Plotted twice. And plotter, a rather amusing variant of plotter, three times. Concentrating on the word conspiracy, about three come from editors or correspondents such as Lady Hervey, and about ten concern the crazy theory hatched in the paranoid brain of Jean-Jacques Rousseau that de Lambert, Horace, Walpole and Hume had entered into a conspiracy against him to lead him into England and ruin him by settling him in the most commodious and agreeable manner and by doubling his income. <laughs> uh, as I say, these two papers are very, very well worth reading. Now, readers of my blog may well be wondering what the hell are you doing reading that out when you're supposed to be writing your novel, The Conquest of Doe. And the reason is that I've had a detour the last week reading about the origins of war, the relationship between money, debt and war, uh, and it's come back full circle now to some causes of civil wars uh, and um, Coriolanus uh, 
cropped up again because there's a chap called uh, Milusus who was a Roman in this area of Rome who gave his um, fortune away uh, and the reason that that cropped up is because I have been reading a book by the name of uh, someone called James Harrington and he wrote a book called The Commonwealth of Oceana and he mentions this period in, in uh, Roman history when he's talking about different forms of government um, and uh, he proposed a kind of an ideal republic which funnily enough uh, the idea of a monarch kind of still gets a looking um, but he distinguishes between aristocracy and uh, oligarchy etc um, and that basically had me ending up here uh, which I'm quite pleased it did so um, anyway have a read of those in your own time and um, uh, I think I shall send uh, Professor Pigeon a, a, an email saying how much I enjoyed his uh, his paper here. <laughs>